Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hi, and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast. Every year in June, the State Bar hosts the State Bar Annual Meeting. Personally, I love the annual meeting. It's a chance to catch up with lawyers from all over the state, make some new friends, and attend fascinating CLE presentations. The highlight for me personally is the opportunity to hang out with our superlative State Bar staff. Seriously, if you haven't spent any time with them, they are just amazing, committed people with, frankly, next-level skills. One of the people who gets to work with that staff and see them up close and in action is the president of the State Bar of Texas. And every year at the annual meeting, we celebrate the passing of the baton to a new president. In 2020, the State Bar was compelled to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic, which was then still in its first few months of existence. You might recall that we had our annual meeting on demand, entirely virtual. It was quite a feat, and I'm very proud of our State Bar for putting that on. This year, 2021, our annual meeting was still virtual, but in a nod to the gradual reopening of our state, Sylvia Barunda Firth was sworn into office in person at the Supreme Court of Texas building as a 2021-2022 president of the State Bar of Texas. The ceremony, which was broadcast over the internet, took place on June 18th, 2021, officiated by Justice Rebecca Huddle. Sylvia's presidency marks a couple of firsts. She's the first Hispanic woman to ascend to the presidency, but here's something interesting. She's also our first president from El Paso, where she has her own solo law firm. Sylvia has seen myriad sides to the practice of law, having been general counsel to American garment finishers and served the city of El Paso in various roles, culminating in her becoming the city attorney for El Paso. Her bar work is too long to list in this podcast, but suffice it to say that Sylvia served on the State Bar Board of Directors from 2014 to 2018, served as a multi-year member of the Texas Bar College, and past president of the Texas City Attorneys Association. Whew, I could go on. That's just a sampling. She's also a Longhorn, having graduated from UT Law in 1984. So let's stop it with the intros and meet our new State Bar President, President Sylvia Barunda Firth. Welcome. Thank you, Rocky, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. No, absolutely, absolutely. So it's been an interesting year and a half here in the state of Texas and all over the country and the world. But honestly, what what I want to talk to you about first was how shocked I am that we've never had a state bar president from El Paso. I mean, how how could that be? How is that possible? Do you think that's do you think that's important and and why? Well, it hasn't been for lack of trying. Some great (laughs) El Paso lawyers have tried before. And in fact, I have the benefit of the fact that my colleague, Sezi Collins, ran two years ago. So I was able to build on the momentum Hmm. that she put in place. So, uh, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of others. And so I give Sezi a lot of credit for the trailblazing she did to get me where I am. But um, I think it's important to note that El Paso is a very unique city. And we are very, very far away from the center of government in the state of Texas. Our legal community is small. There's only about 1,300 lawyers in in our district, 17, which goes not on just El Paso proper, but out into far west Texas. So there's very few of us. And you consider, you know, look at Houston, there's over 26,000 lawyers. And so you have 1,300. Even if absolutely everybody in El Paso votes for you, it's just a blip on the screen. So we have to get out and get our message out to the other parts of the, uh, the state. I mean, if you think about it, and this is like El Paso is actually closer to the state capitals of New Mexico sure. and Arizona than we are <laughs> right. to Austin. So yeah. we're out here. It's, it's, it's a far place to be. But I'm proud to represent El Paso. And I do think it's important Because El Paso is is where I was born and raised, and it's a very special community. I think because we are a truly binational community and right on the border with Mexico and New Mexico, and we have a a huge military presence, so people Mm -hmm. come and go. It's a a, really a, a multicultural, very tolerant community. And so I'm really proud. I'm really proud to to represent El Paso and be able to open the door a little bit to to the rest of the state and say, come come and see about us. 
I, I'm still cracking up when you said when you said we're District 17. I mean, I'm I'm getting this Katniss Everdeen vibe now. I'm thinking, <laughs> oh my gosh, Hunger Games. You know, <laughs> Sylvia like is the winner thing. of the Hunger Games. Okay, mm-hmm. and and yeah. So you know, I, but no, I mean, t- tell us a little bit about. Because I'm ashamed to say I've never been to El Paso. Now that I'm talking to you, you know, and, and it's wow. it's funny. It's it's always been on my list of places I'd like to visit. I've just never had occasion. So, you know, tell us what it's like to practice there, and why do you think it is that? I mean, it, it's 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 a significant city in Texas, but it is. why is it so hard for us to to kind of bring El Paso into the fold? And and how do we fix this? It's just the geography. I mean, when I when I started my campaign. And I, I, I drove east, you know, because I always say nobody gets to say they're from West Texas if I'm in the room because right. um, you can't get any further west. Um, sure. So I, I drove vast expanses to get to the next, you know, the, the, the looking for the lawyers a- along the way. And it's just it's just different. Um, a lot of people will say that El Paso is much more like New Mexico in our our, our culture than we are the rest of Texas. I think that has a, it's, I think it's true. And then there, like I said, there's only there they they take great pride in being independent. When I was campaigning, and I went out to the Trans Pecos area, and I said I'd like to come and speak to the local bar association, and <laughs> they say we don't meet, we never meet. Oh, and really? I was like, okay. what? And we, we when we need when we need something, we reach out to each other. But but they did. They gathered for me, and the, it was a social function. But they did gather, and they came in from. I mean, it was a trek for them to come in. And so uh, I think I think that's it. I do believe that it did help me, you know, the, and there's nothing, you know, the silver lining to everything was when we switched over and were um, campaigning virtually and more reliant on um, Internet, et cetera. I think that actually did help. I, I think that helped me to finally eek by my win. As you recall, I only won by 37 votes. So <laughs> Sure, sure. Well, hey, you know, look, a win is a win. And, and, you know, I know that that you are the first Hispanic woman to assume office, which, again, I didn't know. I've just, when I, when I remember, I remember when you won, the first thing that popped in my head was not, oh, this is a Hispanic woman. I thought, okay, this is, this is our new president-elect for the State Bar of Texas. But before we talk about that, let's talk about your other work in diversity and inclusion. So as president elect, you had you had appointed a task force to look into these issues of diversity and inclusion, and they they came up with a report in June of 2021. Tell us about why why you was appointed a task force and what is their June 2021 report telling us to do? Well, before I before I talk about the report, I really do want to thank the members of that task force. There were 15 of them. And I'm grateful to the board for approving them because normally the president-elect doesn't get to start their work until they're actually the president. The, sure. They don't get to start a project. So I I had the benefit of a few months lead, which has yielded this great report. And I, um, I, I'm really impressed by the, the work that was done by the task force. So there's 15 members. They were each from the affinity committees and sections of the bar. They got to appoint whomever they wanted. And then I held back five positions just to look around and see who wasn't at the table and, and mm. filled in with five five more. They have worked really hard. And the report that they did is stellar. And it's very expansive in what they what they examined. They broke it broke into committees and and did a did a lot of deep dive. But 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 it wasn't the first time this has been done. So that it was not an original idea. In 2007, then president elect Martha Dickey and Eduardo Rodriguez, the one of the only other there remember there's only be three three Hispanic presidents. So Eduardo was president and with Martha, they they com- requested a task force report. Mm. So what we did first was we took that one and said, let's see where we, you know, the snapshot of where we've been, what hasn't been finished that should have been finished and and move forward from there. We found a lot of progress, but we found still that we have a a long way to go. Now, Um, if I could, if I could just, just kind of interject a a quick question for clarification, let's talk for a second about what the, the, you know, I'm using air quotes and I know. For those listening, they can't see it, but I'm doing these really impressive air quotes with my fingers. But what is the problem that we're talking about with diversity and inclusion? Is it about the number of of diverse lawyers? Is it about the diversity and inclusion inside law firm management? 
Is there another problem? Is it all of the above? I mean, can you kind of frame for us what the issue is? Sure. I, I think it's a little bit all, all of the above. Um, okay. So we are not reflective. The lawyer community is not reflective of the population that we serve. There's hmm. still not enough lawyers from diverse backgrounds or that that are that are that are a practicing law. It should it's, it's changing. And as law, law schools admissions are changing. So that's one piece. There's also the question of, as, as you've already alluded to, in leadership at the state bar. It's gotten much better. When I, when I first got involved, there was still a lot of need for diversity around the table. It's gotten better. And then within the law firms, it's like, what's happening? When Martha Dickey posed the question, it's like, what's happening to the women? Hmm. How come there are not more equity partners in the big firms. Um, and so there's it's a, it's a lot of issues, which is why the, the report is very interesting because you can take it in any one of those directions. And huh, so okay. we, we talk about a pipeline to um, create more diverse lawyers. We talk about how we support them when they are already practicing. And then we talk about creating a pipeline to state board leadership as well so that it's not that rare to see a woman Hispanic as the as the president, and I and I will tell you the uh, historical thing that just happened at the last election is this is the first time you have back to back women. So with my friend member. Laura yeah. Gibson won, um, so this is the first time. So you're gonna have two women back to back be state bar president when there's only been a, a, I'm the seventh of 141 state bar presidents. I'm just the seventh woman. So. We're making progress. It's slow, but we're getting there. Do you think we're going to get to a point when when we stop talking about identity? You know, stop saying, oh, well, we've got a woman or we got two women or we got people of color or what have you. Do, do you foresee, you know, in our lifetimes, we're going to get to a point where, okay, somebody becomes state bar president and it doesn't matter their gender, their color, their background, anything like that? Or do you think there's still, do you think we still have a long runway before we reach that goal? You know, I think I'm, I'm I'm very hopeful and optimistic, and I will tell you why. All you have to do is look at the Texas Young Lawyers Association and look at sure. their leadership, and now you begin to see more diverse. And it, to them, it's not a big deal. It's just like a generational thing. I and I really do think it's not going to matter much um, in the near future. Right. So I mean, that means you and I have to make enough money to retire, and then the young lawyers can take over. Get, I get, out I, of I get it. I'm, I'm with you. I understand what you're telling me. But so tell us if you would, and, and I, I made you digress, but the task force, what were their recommendations? So there's, there's a lot of them, but I, I and I, and I'm, I would commend any of the listeners to look at my presidential page because sure. we'll post it there. Oh, good. Um, there, okay. But yeah, so that you can see, because we're, we are clearly not going to finish all of the things that we, uh, that have been recommended, but We'll leave it there for Laura and the next and the next to keep keep chipping away at it and working sure. on it. But some of the some of the highlights were just and this is more general than just DEI. They made suggestions about improving the way that we communicate to to lawyers and communicate information. Okay. They talked about creating incentives for lawyers who voluntarily undertake to study and educate themselves with regard to DEI matters. Mm -hmm. They talked, they, they labeled it um, diversifying the, the Texas Bar Journal. And there was multiple suggestions in there about actually featuring a monthly a story that uh, either featured one of a, a diverse lawyer or, or was a topic of interest to women or, or LGBTQ lawyers or just making sure that they're seeing themselves in the bar journal. Hmm. There's a proposed revision to the, the Texas Lawyers Creed, which is very interesting and, and we'll, we'll take some work if we undertake mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and then they actually recommended the creation of a permanent DEI oversight committee, which is actually, I, I think the task force is piloting that because we act, when, when the board had questions about issues that are uh, affecting diverse lawyers, now you had already a group in place that's very diverse in nature to say, what do you think about this? Make a recommendation to the board. And we've used the task force in that way already. The board at our meeting last week authorized the extension of the task force into my 
presidential year. And ultimately, what we're hoping is the Office of Minority Affairs, and and that's another recommendation, is relabeling that. Mm-hmm. And to be of, of a broader uh, attention, but there's all there's. T- I mean, in fact, that's going to be the the next hard thing we have to do is tr- try to pick the ones that we're going to focus on and work on for my presidential year. Wow, and it's it, it, and that year goes by very quickly, very quickly. I imagine. So mm-hmm. now let's let's go back to to the firsts, right? So we talked about you being the first El Pasoan, for lack of a better term. Actually, what do you guys call yourselves yeah, in El Paso? El Paso, El Paso, El Paso. Okay, yeah, good. It's an El good. Yeah. Okay, good. I like it. We we got it right the first time. That never happens with me, by the way. <laughs> I never get anything right the first time. You can just ask my wife. But you being the first Hispanic woman to become state bar president, are you comfortable with people mentioning that about you, or do we need to talk about that? How important is is that first? Well, you know, already I've had okay what. You need to kind of go back to my career, if you will, in in state bar service. So I came to the bar as a minority, what we used to call minority directors. Right. Which I remember called, minority. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember now they're the term. at large, but minority directors. <laughs> sure. And when I when I went into my interview for that, I asked them to set aside the fact that I was a Hispanic woman. I said mm. because I I'm here. Yes, that's that's part of my reality. I said, but I'm also here because, and I did say, because I'm from El Paso, and El Paso is underrepresented in, in state bar leadership on committees and everywhere else you see, but also because I'm a government lawyer, and government mm-hmm. lawyers are also un- underrepresented in leadership. And so I, I think the combination of all of that was what, what garnered me the position. Um, Lisa Tatum was the president that appointed mm-hmm. me. Okay. but. But I do think it's important because I do believe, no, I know this. I know this for a fact because I've been told this by younger lawyers, already law students who have said, wow, I see you up there and I think I can be that. It's it's mm. still, it's still, I think we shouldn't underestimate the power of people seeing somebody who looks like them in a leadership role or, or has, you know, this common culture with them, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And I do think it's important. And I'm very comfortable with it. I I, I don't I don't think that's the reason I got the position. Sure. And so I think that's just icing on the cake. But then, you know, so like you were talking about how younger lawyers see you and they maybe see you reflecting their future selves. But who did you see? Because if there were no Hispanic women at State Bar Leadership, when you were taking on these positions early on, who did you look to or were you did you go out particularly to blaze a blaze a path for others how did you get yourself into the mindset to kind of get into bar leadership so it's interesting because i had spent my volunteerism as a lawyer in other places because remember mm. i'm a government lawyer so sure. and, you, and you read about that i was the president mm-hmm. of the texas city attorneys association so i was not real active with the state bar mm. in large part because i did believe the state bars for those other people in Dallas and Houston and those giant towers. And every time I saw them, it was, you know, these big, big firm men from, you know, made this their career. And I, I didn't, I really, I didn't really pay much attention to, to the state bar, but then I started hearing rumblings of like, you know, the state bar is not relevant and just Mm. rumblings around me. And so uh, I, I started paying a little more attention I saw in the bar journal the, the solicitation for minority directors and I wondered about it. And I, and I spoke to a, a friend here in El Paso who was really the only lawyer that I knew well who had been involved in state bar service. Um, and I, I, I said, what is this minority director? And do they really, are they serious? Do they really want somebody like me at the table? And he said, oh, you would do this? You would be willing to? And I said, yeah. And he sponsored me. And then by then, Lisa Tatum, mm. who is the last woman to be the state bar president, was the state bar president. So now I have somebody there who's, you know, blazing mm-hmm. the trail. So, you know, she picked me and put me there. And then about that time, and I think that Lisa, Lisa's being there brought more people to the table and willing to willing to put your name into consideration because it seems more likely because now Mm -hmm. you've seen other women, other, I I mean, but even I will tell you that last week, so you know how the state bar meeting works. We have the one, the one meeting on Wednesday is the old administration. And then on Thursday, it's the new. 
So I had lawyers who were in the room say, it was startling that on Wednesday, you were the only woman sitting up at the big table. Mm. And then, then here came Thursday, and then Laura was next to me. And then Santos Vargas, who's our new mm-hmm. chair of the board, who's a Hispanic from San Antonio, is up there. Is like, oh, look, look what, what a difference one election made. And then w- this reverse was true. When I was looking out at the directors, it was also more diverse, too. So we're making lots of progress. So let's let's switch gears for a second because I want to make sure we get to we also get to some of your some of your agenda items during your year as president. On June seventeenth, twenty twenty one, the day before you actually officially became president, you talked about legal deserts. I have to I have to admit when I heard about it, I thought, wow, that's just one s off from legal desserts, and that might actually <laughs> sound pretty cool. Like I I wonder what lawyers would eat for desserts if we became chefs, but when my mind got back to the task at hand, I was like, all right, legal deserts. Tell us, tell us what that means and how do you plan to address it in the, in the short time you have? I mean, a year goes by fast. Right. So as I mentioned before, when I, when I started my campaign, I started my backyard. So I went to um, Alpine and Marfa and all those areas out here in far west Texas. And and at that social function I talked to you about, sure. I was told there there there's a shortage of lawyers out here and, and we need more lawyers out here. And we don't really know how to go about getting them here, but we're we're kind of putting it at your door. You're here saying you want our vote. What are you gonna do about it? And I said, like, well, that's I've never heard question. that in the big cities. We never hear we need more lawyers. I well, mean, that's <laughs> well, then that's... it gets even better because then I kept driving and I got to Midland to Odessa, Midland. And I'm now there with, oh, with the lawyers in what in in those areas are big firms, you know, the si- firms sure. of any size. Sure. And they say to me, we need more lawyers. Wow. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well. Right now, when the uh, economy is booming, all the lawyers out here are engaged working um, oil and gas work, petroleum stuff. But there's nobody out there doing what I guess the term is Main Street lawyer kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, sure. if you need if you need a divorce, you need a will, you're mm-hmm. going to buy your house, set up a partnership. There are very few lawyers out there and mm-hmm. people are having to travel distance to get that or wait weeks and in some cases, if you think about some of those family law situations, that's dangerous for people to have to wait. Sure. Well, then I have a, a, you know, so there's more. And then a friend of mine who is a district attorney out in the 106 that covers a vast area out in West Texas, he tells me he's having trouble recruiting lawyers to come work in the DA's office. Oh, and by the way, the federal public defender out there tells mm. me I can't get lawyers out here to come work out here. Mm. Uh, and on top of that, when I have criminal appointment, when the judges have criminal appointments to make, there's nobody to give them to. Sure. So we have an access to justice issue out here. So it's like, wow, that was, you know, that was, That's you surprising. go out there. Yeah. And yeah. you go out there and you ask people, what do you need? How can I help you? And then you get the answer. You're like, wow, that's a, that's a tough one. I don't, I really don't know how we tackle that. But even then, even I was just very early in my campaign, I, I talked to Trey Atfill, the executive mm-hmm. director of the sure. board, and I said, Trey, I keep hearing this in different places, so put a pin in that because if I'm lucky enough to win, uh, I'm going to want to talk about that. And if I'm not lucky enough to win, I still want to talk about it. Do we need to? Sure. We, we got some issues out in, in the remote areas of the state. Well, it wasn't just far west Texas. If you went up into the panhandle, if you went far east, if you went on the border, southern border, there's other pockets like that. And I talked about it enough that and I was like, give me your ideas. Tell me. So, you know, Dallas has they actually have the Main Street Lawyer Program where they're trying to mm-hmm. cultivate and support the lawyers that will do the work that most the average citizen needs and, and sure. you know, not pay the the big law firm hourly fees. This is just somebody, you just need somebody to look over your deed or or write your will or whatever. And they're fostering them under that program. Sure, absolutely. Which, okay, so I was like, that's interesting. But I think I talked about it enough to enough people that then all of a sudden I got a phone call from a, a fellow at um, the Decent Center at the SMU Law School. And the SMU Law School is pro- piloting a program they call STAR. And it's STAR stands for Small, tribal, 
and rural communities. Hmm. And it's a justice uh, program that they, they're they modeling after other states. And part of it is kind of, it, it has the flavor of like, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but remember the movie, uh, the TV show, Northern Exposure? If you oh, put, yes. Put I them am, there and you support them. I resemble them. that remark, yes. <laughs> I don't know if you're old enough to remember. Oh, yes, it. I am. Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, so it's kind of, it has that element to it, except right. that it's um, not only placing a, a lawyer there. It's like bringing them there when they're still in law school, giving them an externship, having the, the legal community build a support around them Got so it. that they're not out there. And hopefully it'll take root. The bigger programs in other states have student loan forgiveness attached to it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot. So I'm still studying that and I'm still working and state bar staff is working with me to see how it's appropriate for the state bar to engage in something like that. But I'm very encouraged by both those programs, the Dallas uh, Main Street Lawyer Program and then the STAR program and then using TOGI, which already right. exists, Frank Stevenson. Frank Stevenson, TOGI. absolutely. Yeah. So a, a lot of uh, using TOGI to kind of in, introduce that for the rural areas as well. Again, technology, I think, is going to lead the way. I think, I think we... If we've learned anything from the pandemic, there's a yes. lot of things that we never imagined that we would do remotely that we can do very well remotely. So I some think cases even that, better, even in some better, cases even better than than, mm-hmm. than doing it in person. Now I will tell you that some of those rural those legal deserts they lack broadband capability too. So well, that's a that. whole another that's a whole another issue. So. That's the, yeah that and that that may be well beyond mm-hmm. our scope as lawyers. We kind of have to work with with the technology that's in place. Right. But, Let's talk about the McDonald versus Sorrell's lawsuit. And for those that are unfamiliar, you know, it might help if you can kind of tell us, tell us a little bit about, about the issues in that case. But it basically boils down to whether we have a volunteer state bar or whether we have a mandatory state bar. And as I understand it, your position is it needs to be a mandatory state bar. So if you could kind of walk us through where we are on that lawsuit and tell us why you support a mandatory bar. Sure. It might might help us understand the rest of your position on that. Sure. So we right now we're waiting for a decision out of the Fifth Circuit. The arguments were done, I believe, in March. And so we're waiting for Fifth Circuit ruling uh, with regard to the constitutionality of uh, of a mandatory bar. We feel sure. very strong that there's you know, decades of precedent that will support the continuation of the mandatory bar. But more than that, I think it's important for us to get the buy-in from the lawyers, not just, mm. okay, that this is this is the way it exists, but to understand why we think it's important. So and why I, is it? Yeah, please we tell think it's a, yeah. yeah, I'll tell you, because it's unique for us to have the ability to self-govern in Texas. Doctors mm. don't have that ability. Dentists mm. don't have it. Architects, CPAs, they're all regulated by state agencies, if we right. will, and we sure. get we get the right to do it ourselves, and to the degree, and we think we do it better. We think that lawyers understand the way lawyers practice law better than an agency or a board, maybe just appointed by the governor. I mean, just sure. if you if you would try to imagine, if you will, what would this look like if tomorrow it was to is to disappear. It's not that the lawyers will be will will be allowed to exist without regulation. Somebody else will take up the the right. responsibility, and and it, it may not be. Um, it was, certainly won't be anything we have control over like we do now, and it may not be something that that we like. So, it, yes, our system can always be improved, um, but we would like to trust lawyers to do it rather than uh, political appointees. I think that, you know, it's important we get to vote on our leadership. We talked about that already. We get to vote on our own disciplinary rules, which we just did. We had mm-hmm. a, a, in the midst of the pandemic, look how much work got mm-hmm. done by the state bar. Absolutely. Um, we had that, we had the rules of approval, which by the way, the Supreme Court has already approved as well. Those those rules will become effective um, first, first of July. Well, it's, a, and it's we official. Get to, it's official now. And um, we get to vote on the, on the amount of our dues. Which is important too. The the what what people you and if you follow social media like I do and had to do it for my campaign and mm-hmm. and that's the way we communicate now. People right. will talk about you know what do I get for my dues and if you think you think and it's our dues are not that cumbersome if you think they range from sixty eight dollars a year 
for the lawyers that are licensed um, less than three years. And the maximum is $235 a year Mm -hmm. for those that are licensed more. And then remember, you age out. After you get a certain age, you don't even have to pay dues. Because of the sound fiscal management of the state bar, we haven't had a dues increase in 30 years. 1991 Mm -hmm. was the last time. So I think we're doing a good job self-governing. And I think it's important for lawyers to accept that fact and, and be supportive of it as well. Thank you for the for the detail on that so we can kind of get our arms around it. I, I want to play make-believe for just a second. I want to imagine, and maybe this won't be make-believe, maybe this could actually happen. So imagine there's going to be a movie on your life and you're going to be played, for present purposes, you're going to be played by Michael J. Fox. And I'm going to tell you why. Because he's going to move back in time to UT graduation, 1984. What would Michael's portrayal of Sylvia say to the 1984 Sylvia about the path that lay ahead. And more importantly, would you make any changes and disrupt the space-time continuum? (laughs) Well, that's, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question because I've already been thinking about what I will say to law law students. My calendar is already filling up with invitations to speak at orientations. And so I've already been thinking like, what do you, what do you say to them? You know, what, 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 what can you impart to them? Number one, I, I would I would say to them to not be so rigid in or, or say this to myself. I mean, because you you went over like my career and kind of all the different things that I've done in my career. And I would have never. Well, with the exception of one job, which is the job <laughs> that I always wanted, I would have never anticipated the other things. Sure. So it's like be, be open to opportunities. You know, the practice of law is very exciting and diverse and don't miss out on an opportunity just because you've set your sights on this one dream job that you have to have and and you other opportunities may be coming around you and you don't even realize these great opportunities so don't don't be so set in your ways be flexible um i'd also would say if you find yourself in a place where you're not happy Mm. if you're if you've gone into a, a made a career choice that's making you less than happy or is unfulfilling or don't be afraid to make a change. Don't be afraid to, it is scary when you're, and I've been there. It really is. Yes. It really is very scary because you have this security of what you know, and you're looking at the unknown or even just stubbornness. In my case, I have overstayed a job just out of stubbornness because I was like, (laughs) I'm not going to be beat by these people. They will not break me. You know, I'm working for them out of spite. (laughs) (laughs) But it, but why? You know, life is too short. You only have one life. And don't measure your success by other people. Just because other people That's are a doing hard one. this. That one is really that hard. Is a real, it's, especially when you look around, you know, and you see all the humble bragging that happens online. Yeah, you know, exactly. And, and you think, oh, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not in my private jet flying somewhere to, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, speak for yourself. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but I just that I think I mean there's you measure everybody measures success in different ways and that's okay that's as it should be you know it's like if you're happy working from your home um, because your toddlers are in the other room and you know they're there and you're not making as much money as you could if you were downtown at the big firm but you're happy that's all that you need to be worried about and and you're doing a good job at what you do and that would be what I would say to Sylvia Borunda who was you know. Was never going to, which by the way, was the thing is funny, never going to come home to El Paso. I'm leaving. I'm never <laughs> going somewhere else. And now here you are. Yeah, here I am. And and very proud to be here. We could talk about this all day because there's, there's a lot here, but we are, we are running short of time. And, and again, this was a real pleasure. So President Sylvia Barunda Firth, I want to thank you for, for joining us and, and of course, thank you for your bar service, not only what you've done, but what lay ahead. And you know, best of luck with your presidency. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking for, it's, it feels real. Um, the fact we were able to gather last week for the, for the board meeting, as, as you said, it's just, uh, we, lawyers live on the energy of other people. So it was great to be around the others. I'm looking forward uh, to a, a very busy, the, 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 First year directors coming in are full of energy and ready to go. And the second year directors, God bless them, who never got to have an in-person meeting their whole first year right. are full of energy and revitalized. So we got two classes of directors that are ready to to work. And um, 
I think I think we we have plenty. We've got a laundry list of things to do, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm really in, in energized and looking forward to to working hard to to make El Paso proud for their first president and to just just do a good job. I think there's there's a lot riding on you, and I think you're going to come through with flying colors. So again, thank, thank you, you for joining us today. And of course, of course, I want to thank you for tuning in and listening. And I want to encourage you, of course, to continue to stay safe and be well. If you like what you heard today, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, life's a journey, folks. I'm Rocky Deer, signing off. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.